Vad vi tänkte göra innan vi går på paus det är att bara få liksom en, en quick download av vad är det för framgångsfaktorer som framgångsrika B2B-aktörer har. Och då skulle jag bjuda upp Andy. Are you here somewhere? Andy, Andy is a, a rockstar analyst from Forrester. Uh, and I want you, Johan, come back here. Johan from Avencia. And if I ever have a TV show, it will look exactly like this. Welcome to Stockholm, Andy. Nice have a you. seat. So I'm Opera and you are the other guys in the show, okay. right? Uh, <clears throat> and, and we just short and condensed because we're going to have the pleasure of hearing much more of you later. What sets really successful e-business companies apart from those who are just mainstream? Would you like to answer or shall I? You can go, yeah, you can start. Okay. You know, I, the way we look at this is uh, generally there are three components to a successful uh, e-business for a B2B company. One is what we call people, two is processes, and three is technologies. It takes a combination of the three. If you're overweighted in one area and underweighted in another area, you'll eventually have to balance them out. So if you're strong uh, with a staff and leadership, but you have weak technology and mm -hmm. you don't have the right sort of mindset or culture in your organization, you're not going to be successful. Similarly, if you have a strong culture, but weak leadership or weak technology, you get the point. You have mm -hmm. to have all three. It's like a three-legged stool. But how do, you, how do you drive that then? Who is it that should be sort of the change agent? Is this a smart CEO? There's not too many of them around. Or is it sort of IT or marketing? Or it's difficult to know everything you need to know in one space. Yeah, I was actually going to say that they, are they need to be balanced. But there's actually a, a prioritization. And the very first, in my opinion, is the people part. Mm -hmm. If you have the right leadership, they will know how to create the right culture. Mm -hmm. And they will know how to acquire and use and leverage the right technology. I see one of the biggest mistakes I see companies make is they go buy the technology first. Mm -hmm. Technology vendors hate it when I say that. Um, but I've just dealt with so many issues where companies bought a world-leading technology. They implemented it. And they implement it exactly for the wrong reasons. Mm. And it doesn't fit their model. They end up having to either significantly change it, or the term we use is rip and replace. It costs more money and more time than if they'd just done their homework up front, hired the right people who would set the right tone, and then you buy the right technology. But it starts with leadership. And I agree with you on the CEOs. I, I, I'm, I'm going to stop <laughs> you there. <laughs> Everybody's going to <laughs> no, 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 three things that sets them apart. Yeah, but we can start with the CEO who should lead the change. I've seen amazing CEOs leading the change from top down and get amazing results. And I've seen groups in organization who made the change from that perspective. Mm. So there is not a one single route that fits all. Sometimes, yeah, you do have a great CEO who can do the change. Sometimes you have a group of people who are really dedicated and you see the transformation from that side. So it's, there are different options and different ways to get there. But you need that, as we talked about before, the passion and the will to actually make the change. But they're tough decisions, especially if you sort of t you, you saw the slide on the CFO, uh, you know, start with his head in the ground. Yeah. Uh, and you also told me, I made a note there, don't buy things over phone when on toilet. I made that yeah. note as well. No, but, but you have the CFO, and they're saying, if they just say, now with lemon taste, they make this much money, or some, some mm. sort of very linear decision, doing what you're doing right now a little bit better, or you go into a massive investments, change all the processes, fire people, hire people, and you don't really know what that's, where that's going to take you. How do you sort of, how do you see decision making being done there? What are, the, are there any guiding principles? I've seen CFOs doing the other analysis. We still look at the curve today, that the curve will actually look like this in the way of growth. is actually a curve going that way, because mm. you're not amping your business. So I, I see great companies are the ones that are most scared when things go well because then you know they can actually fall down or someone else can do something great. So what I see is companies who are actually getting more focused when things go well are the ones that would survive. Actually, so don't relax and just be, okay, we actually invested that, now we see curves getting out of the way, we can relax for a bit. No, the companies are actually feeling that the curve is on the right way and now we should even put more sparkle to it, other ones are succeeding. But, so both of you, if you have the right people, brilliant attitude, everybody sort of embraces change, and you, you bought really good systems. So what are then the steps? Are there any sort of, from where I am right now to excellence, what are some of the necessary operational steps, if you like? Well, my feeling is, and I'm an American, so I use lots of aphorisms and cliches, but uh, one of my favorites is, if you aim for nothing, you're bound to hit it. 
And <laughs> too many companies don't have a plan. They could do all those things you just mentioned, but not have a strategy or roadmap. Mm. That's ostensibly the result of hiring the right people, having the right mindset, mm -hmm. and acquiring the right technology. But it's one of the things that has to happen first. Mm. And you were talking about the B2B CEOs. They have to be, they're an integral part of that conversation. If they are not on board with the transformation that this means for a lot of B2B companies, and I'm gonna be candid about this, it is a transformation. It is not evolutionary, it mm. is in many cases revolutionary. Mm. If they are not on board with that, I've actually had friends of mine who work for these companies, you know, one to two to three years into this, they're still struggling in evangelizing and trying to get the company on board and they ask me, you know, what, what can I do? And I just have to be honest and say, I think it's time for you to leave. Because if the CEO has not actually bought into this, and I see this all the time too, the CEO, the eyes are bigger than the stomach. Well, we, we've got to do digital, so we're going to go hire somebody. They'll, they'll pay out, you know, millions of dollars to bring somebody in, and then they won't make it possible for that person to be successful. Mm. They walk in the front door, and they say, great, you can have a budget, but we're not going to change our go-to-market strategy. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, the companies, the, these digital people don't know what to do. No, I, I call it uh, generals without armies. Mm. And they're always agenda point number 11. If we have time, and, and there's a complete difference when it's like agenda point number one and everybody's embracing it. And usually, I see that quite a lot, like for instance, in media companies and, and you know, where things are going very, very badly, they become much more, uh, you know, uh, they're much more uh, bound for change or for doing radical things. Um, I, I would like to, to learn a little bit about mistakes. What are common mistakes? Buying technology first, that was something that's a good point. Other things? One common thing I see is actually with, with golf clubs. If you suck at playing golf, new golf club probably won't help you. You should be in the driving range and use the clubs you have. So sometimes I see people having overinvested in a system that no one knows how to use. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a classic mistake, because the solutions itself won't, won't help you. So that's a classic mistake I, mm -hmm. I, I see. And as you talk about the commitment from the, the CEO, you need to sort of put your money where your mouth is when it comes to ambition. Mm -hmm. If you want to be on top in your, your sector, you need to do the, the work and investments to get there. So it's a lot of sort of imbalance between the visions and actually the work doing it. Common would, mistakes? Yeah, I would say, and this is going to sound a bit odd, um, or counterintuitive, but over planning. So I said you have to have a vision, mm -hmm. but having a vision is not the same thing as having a five year plan. No. I don't mean the communist five year plan, but for some larger organizations, it is sort of a, <laughs> a communist five year plan where they're predicting what's going to happen you know, in the year 2020. Mm. Does everybody in this room know what's going to happen in the year 2020? You know, the iPad is only five years old. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, these things change very frequently. So what you have to do is build, you know, have a direction you're heading in, hire good people, and then iterate is the word I was going to mm -hmm. use, mm -hmm. is you've got to put something out there, get market reaction, adjust, move on, as opposed to many organizations, I think everyone in this room would agree with this, they want to plan three to five years out. Mm -hmm. And they want to say in five years we want to be at this point, and we're going to buy this technology, and they have a a marketing requirements document or a product requirements document. I talked to a company the other day, 78 page long marketing requirements document. And they looked at me and said, what do you think about that? And I literally had to bite my tongue because I wanted to say, that is absolutely insane. <laughs> and it wasn't even a big, it wasn't even a big company. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they put, the, how long did it take to make a 78 page MRD? And how far are you going to get into that MRD before you're invariably going to change your direction? Because yeah, and if you've written it, you're really politically chained to it. So you really want it to make sense whether it does or not. And that's a really big problem, I think, with not testing and, mm. and not being iterative. Yeah. There's a cliche saying that be different with companies who do things and the company that doesn't do things are the companies who do things do things. <laughs> and that's the thing sometimes. That you I'll trade you one. This is yeah. from Einstein. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Yeah. <laughs> but, but no, but it, it, we, were, uh, we were working with the bank and, and in, in these incubation labs we have for the bank. And they said, okay, we want to do a virtual bank. That was the idea. And they all have six weeks to prove it and get it done and get it out. And the first thing they did was they asked people, would you like to have a virtual bank? Nobody wants to have a virtual bank. Nobody wants to go in and walk around like a dwarf in a bank and you know, walk around in, in such a setting. It was a super dumb idea. And then they asked the question, so if you would have to do something virtual with us, what would you do? 
Now, I would love to look at an apartment virtually so I know if I would go there or not to the showing. And then they called up people that had lots of apartments and said, we would love to offer that to our customers. So six weeks later, they have a cardboard so that when you buy an apartment, you can then go look at the apartment and you can get a loan directly into the virtual app and they send that with their bank's logo on the cardboard. Mm -hmm. So, so they would, if they would have done what you did, it would be three years down the line and the biggest you know, screw up in virtual yeah. reality. Yeah. How many, actually, how many people here are familiar with PayPal? So I once had a conversation with the CEO and founder of PayPal. Uh, this was many years ago, actually, back in the mid-2000s. And uh, I said, hey, tell me, what's the story of PayPal? Because we all know that they were founded in like 1997, 1998, mm -hmm. and it took them several years, and eventually they were successful, and now they're a multi-billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. They split away from, from eBay. And he said, well, you know, we raised about $65 million dollars. And we blew 60 million of the 65 million dollars with the wrong idea, mm, mm. which was just well ahead of its time. They wanted to do digital cash so that you could just mm, exchange mm, cash, mm. which I think is where we're going to be in about yeah. 10 years or so. But the market wasn't right for that. And they spent, they spent like 90% of their money on that. And they said, if we'd had 60 million instead of 65 million, there would be no PayPal. Mm, mm, mm. And so I think big companies have to think the same way. Mm. Get the idea right first, and the only way to get the idea right mm. is to get market feedback. Mm, mm. And you can't just plan something out and expect it. No company, Amazon, Google, none of these companies will tell you that they know what's going to happen five years down the road, but they all have directions they mm, want to head mm. in. And so they start down that path, and they iterate, and they change. Yeah. Amazon and has a yeah. six-month plan and then a 20-year vision. Last thing, because we're going to get some coffee and tea. Just name one company that you're impressed by, and if I want to learn more about B2B, I should check out what they're doing. Yeah, I, I overused this one, but since this is a new audience, maybe this is new. Uh, a company called Granger uh, in the United States. Actually, it's a global company. Um, but they are a company that sort of ticks off all of those things. It's a, market, it's a uh, um, maintenance, repair, and operations company. So the light bulbs and all the stuff that you would buy for a theater, they would sell you that. Uh, but the short story on Granger is that the current CEO, his first job back in the mid-90s, and this was a real title for those of us who remember this, he was the VP of Internet. And that was his first job at the company. Now he's the CEO of the company. So it's embedded in the DNA of the company. Mm -hmm. So when the current... Uh, person in charge of e-commerce goes to the CEO and says, hey, I need money to do X, Y, and Z. He doesn't have to persuade the CEO of the value of e-commerce because clearly that person gets it. Mm -hmm. uh, they also set up a separate operation for their company. So there's sort of what they call the mothership, which is the corporate headquarters where people wear suits and ties and not jeans. And then they have their e-commerce operation in a separate part uh, about 20, 30 miles away, where it looks more like you would see at Yahoo or Google or Facebook. Where so they're I, I, in, in the interest of time, I need to if stop you it. Green, just I, I could take a local example. Like I say, Procurator, for yeah. example, uh, with Magnus Buren, who's what I'm really fascinated there is he's eager to always do new things, mm. always make it better, always uh, look into, for example, to have Aptus, get more information about the customer who can, can make mm. a, a greater. Um, Offer to the customer. And that's a smaller compared to Granger, but it's local and they're doing a great job and they have this eager to never relax. There's always something better they can do for the customer. So, so I think that's amazing as well. We are going uh, into a break right now. There's coffees and teas. There's a lot of interesting things you can see and interesting people you can talk to out there in the break. So when you hear the voice calling you black, back, please uh, come back here. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>